broken. <laughs> hello, hello. Welcome to Actors Anonymous Podcast. I'm your host, We Sam Kish. Co-hosting with me and having trouble with his headphones is Mr. Jordan Burbank. Court ordered to be here. You are court yeah, ordered. It's part of the mandate. Speaking of court ordered, I got my first jury summons. <laughs> I remember that. You told me that. Uh, we'll see how that goes. It's about um, being an American, we Sam. America? <laughs> are you, you going to do it or are you going to find excuses to get out of it? I, I, I can't say on air. <laughs> <laughs> I eat babies. You know, who knows? uh, I don't know. Maybe when I get there, I'll have a positive experience and I'll just be like, yeah, well, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll be on the trial. (laughs) Like I have much of a choice. I don't know what I'm saying. You just go in there like trying to do like the the law and order song. Just like, dun, 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 dun. dun." (laughs) Sorry, could you please stop? My friend tried to get on the jury and he still got rejected. I think like there, there's so many, he got to the point where the different lawyers are asking questions about like of you and they get to dismiss a certain number of people. And he was like, he was out. He was gone. But like, I don't know. He he thinks it's because he looked too inquisitive, and they're like, no, he's going to do... We need someone that's just going to sort of listen to the things we say, not... Think? Try to... Yeah, try... <laughs> not try to 12 Angry Minute. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, I wonder if, like, you want... Like, do you want someone on a jury if they want to be on a jury? <laughs> I'd be I, like, mm. <laughs> I think you kind of don't. Yeah. Like, I think I think if you look too keen, they're like, I don't trust this person. There yeah. you go. There's your technique to go. Okay, I'm going to try that. If you're listening to the podcast right now and you're wondering who is this uh, British person <laughs> talking, we've got the very talented and funny Matt Kirshen on the show. He's a, an amazing comedian, uh, world-renowned, London-born. Uh, he has appearances on the Jimmy Fallon show, Craig uh, Late Show with Craig Ferguson, a finalist on NBC's Last Comic Standing. His debut CD, I Guess We'll Never Know, was named Punchline Magazine's Top 10 Albums of 2009, which I have listened to, by the way. Thank you. And it's wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, He has written for numerous TV shows, uh, radio shows, and has a podcast called Probably Science, where four professional comedians, incompetent scientists, that's the bio I got. (laughs) Yeah. You know what? We had a... Talk about science, basically. Yeah, we've we've had to rewrite that, because that's on the website. And then recently, uh, we tried to... because what, what happens is we normally go through the week in science news with mm-hmm. with comedians. Yeah. And then every so often we have special episodes where we bring on a real scientist. But we describe ourselves as like professional comedians and incompetent scientists. <laughs> right. Because that's true. We have an interest in science. We have a vague background in it. Yeah. But we, you know, we, we don't know our stuff compared to people who really know their stuff. But then I realized there's an ambiguity in that. Set. So we tried to get in touch with one particular scientist about it. And he sort of Googled it and it's like... So uh, you're calling me an incompetent scientist? It's like f- four professional comedians and incompetent scientists joined. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're the real scientist. Yeah, no, no, no. That adjective, dis- b- both of those bits describe us. <laughs> those, those, that's that's badly worded. That's on us. That's our problem. Well, <laughs> speaking of scientists, I think I want to kick this off. Uh, how about that alien, so-called alien megastructure they found in space? Did you hear about this? No. So what basically, is, uh, you were talking about. It. I don't remember what you're saying. Then. So basically, they, they they were searching the night skies. Okay. And they found this anomaly around this set of stars, and it's basically like flashing. It's like pulse, not not, not like pulsating, like a like one of those crazy supernova stars or mm-hmm. uh, pulsars, I think they're called. But like, it's just this massive structure, and they're like, we don't know what it is so uh-huh. they're they're not they're not saying it's alien for sure but they're like it could be alien like, is like <laughs> foreign it's like it's very weird, foreign i'm gonna have yeah. to look up this story because yeah. we're recording later on today i'll see if that well when did that happen a few days ago actually yeah that's why the traffic in la was so bad yesterday. yeah i think that's, <laughs> that's exactly what it was, <laughs> it was um <laughs> yeah if you were part of that i, I hope that guy's okay that guy i i mean like mentally uh, your listeners won't know the the entire the whole of la was basically the 101 freeway, which runs through LA, which at the best of times is pretty bad. Right. Uh, particularly around rush hour, which is when it was. But there was a guy on the bridge for a while threatening to jump. And they had they basically closed down the road and they put out the big, like, whatever you call those massive air mattress things that... Right. Bouncy like, castles. Bouncy castles, yeah. <laughs> yeah the kind of thing that stunt stunt performers land on normally. Like targets with the clowns. <laughs> just trying to hold it out there. And they had, uh, yeah, they had those out on the road. And uh, yeah, he, I don't know. The ju- they got the person to safety. Well, that's and, good. Yeah. Uh, I know that that traffic, uh, like, filtered onto the side streets so... Oh, yeah, the whole, the whole place was screwed. I became a different person trying to get from the valley to Hollywood to see Crimson Peak. I was like... 
I was just like, what is, what have I become? Yeah. <laughs> How many people have I killed? You definitely, <laughs> it changes your attitude. Like at the beginning, you're like, oh, the poor guy. Like he's just like, I just hope he gets the help he needs. And then I, I was looking at Twitter because I was trying to see when it was going to clear because I was going to a party in the valley. And and uh, you saw people kind of like bite. After the first hour or so, they're like, fucking shove him. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. And you're like, why couldn't you do this in your home? No. <laughs> yeah. So awful. <laughs> if you're going to commit suicide, do it somewhere that doesn't inconvenience. And like, you saw those things and everyone's <laughs> normally followed up by like, oh, I shouldn't have written that. But yeah, yeah, just, yeah. You just created a world of people to hate you. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thought that should stay in but man that that's got to be so rough and i i i don't i want to i don't want to stay, stay too long on the subject but i can't I, like i can't imagine being at that point you know like that's a really dark place to be at it is and also it's nearly always a temporary place like there's so many people who've nearly like nearly done it or even mm. tried and, and failed and they've pretty much always said like god i'm so glad that didn't happen or i didn't go through right What's the line? It's like a permanent uh, solution to a temporary problem. Ah, but yes. I just can't imagine. This, this show's got heavy quickly, hasn't yeah, it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but also, it's like LA, so I picture they'd be like, "No, I won't jump. Yeah. Maybe I should take pictures of me." Fifteen minutes. There's like a fan underneath them <laughs> yeah. blowing their hair up. So, Matt, like obviously, like speaking of dark times, I think for any artist, whether they be an actor or comedian or a painter or writer, director, whatever, they, we go through all those dark times and it's at different levels for people. Yeah. H here's the thing. Okay, I, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, here's what I think. Y yeah, on the one hand, as a, as a performer, you, there, there is, it is playing weird tricks with your ego, but, or like any job which is so career-minded and you get such a clear indicator of your career level and also it's so up and down right because you know you people who are career-minded in the business world you might be eyeing the ladder but you don't generally bump up and down the ladder with regularity mm. whereas in the showbiz you go hot and cold so that does play those tricks on your head but at the same time i think there's that sort of that idea of the sad clown that people love and like the whole oh behind Mm. he's so happy on stage and behind closed doors. I, I just think that's, I think it's bullshit. Like, I yeah. think, I think it's, I think the truth is, as we found out, I don't know what the, the profession is of the guy last night, but I think the reason a lot of comedians have depression is that a lot of people have depression. Yeah. And it's ah. just like, it's a very common, but rarely spoken about condition. But comedians are a, the people who will talk about it because that's kind of your job to go out there and blurt it out um and also when it happens it has that irony it has that sort of like no one talks about the the tears of the surveyor mm. whereas when when it's a comedian it has that sort of contrast that irony and people are like oh my god of course he's like yeah people who are happy on stage or who make people happy get sad sometimes like oncologists get cancer sometimes it doesn't mean yeah, it. like yeah, it's yeah, just yeah 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 that's it, a good point it's just because they're common conditions. They're that, common things that happen. That oddly made me feel better. I don't know why. When you, whenever you realize like everybody's in the shit too, yeah, it's like okay, I'm not alone. Yeah, depression's hugely prevalent across. I think across society, but then people notice it much more when it's people in the entertainment industry because they're more they're more public, right? They're more open, and it has that. Yeah, and it has that sort of happy sad contrast that right. piece of people think there's something more deep going on than just no nah, it's just he's a comedian and he is sometimes depressed yeah. right i think the, the the more predominant you are in your like in the entertainment industry i feel like the more you're persecuted against too which is even more like you know you're mm. thrown so much yeah, into the public spotlight and like the minute you do something wrong everyone is there to like step on top of you too so it's like probably an enhancer too yeah but... oh totally there and it is a weird thing that like anyone in any branch of showbiz firstly to want to do it and secondly the things it does to your head because you are you, you like there's no other type of job where you get such regular adulation and then criticism like yeah. you except yeah. maybe maybe politics uh yeah maybe on the worst like very aggressive <laughs> yeah. yeah or being a being a monarch or whatever but like if it, I, I can't apart from that people applaud when you start work like as a comedian they before you even said anything they cheer you entering your workplace right 
and then they clap. They constantly clap at you and laugh at you, and then cheer on the way out. And you sort of go, "That's not a normal thing for someone to do." <laughs> or they don't. And that's also not a normal. <laughs> that's the worst. Guys, this conversation is making me feel blue. <laughs> Get it? Oh my gosh! I'm not a comedian, Matt. <laughs> um, have you seen Heckler? No, I haven't. It's you know what I'm talking about the documentary. Is that Jamie Kennedy's documentary? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I haven't seen it. I, I know of it. It made me. I was like, oh my gosh, that's got to be the most nerve wracking thing. Have you ever been heckled? Oh yeah. It... Okay, here's the thing about. Yes, please. Here's Enlighten about me because I have no... This is a... By the way, stand-up comedians, I did it once and I was like, oh man, this is super different and difficult it's, and wow, well, I have we a much talk- a better appreciation for it. Well, we were talking about this just before the show started because you just did a talk show for the first time uh, recently mm-hmm. and you were like, I find it so weird being in front of an audience but being me rather than being a character and I'm so the other way around. Like, I have acted and I, I've enjoyed it but I'm so much more at home like, so much more at home being me. And actors are always the other way around. They're like, I don't know how you do it just being you out there. And I'm like, I don't know how you do it saying other people's words all the time, but <laughs> making them feel real. Like, I, they're not, that's not what I'd say. <laughs> I wouldn't say that at all in this situation. <laughs> Can that's... you imagine an actor saying that? Yeah. <laughs> just say the lines, Matt. <laughs> yeah. Damn it. <laughs> but I wouldn't say that because you're not meant to be you. <laughs> you know, that's not my name. That's not my name there. And I'm not married to this woman. <laughs> Why am I pretending to be married to this woman? This is weird. <laughs> I'm imagining you arguing with like Tarantino about this. Yeah. He's like, "Why did I cast you?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't. I just don't think I should have a gun. I don't like him. <laughs> Violent. I don't know, Quinn. Yeah. <laughs> and so many cuss words. Like I wouldn't use so many cuss words. Uh, but he- yeah. yeah. He- here's the deal with heckling. Like it's. Yes, I've been heckled quite a lot, and more so in the UK, because in UK audiences think that you're meant to heckle more. Because uh, like, they're, they're drinking? Yeah, <laughs> no, they, uh, I think they more, they more believe that you're meant to. Like, it's like, yeah, you'll get people who, particularly in, like, regional gigs that happen monthly, those kind of shows. Yeah. Rather than, and you'll have someone go, like, up to come up to you after the show, who's been just a pain the entire show, and just go, like, oh, I'll tell you what. I come every month. No, I always heckle. I always heckle co- comedians. And you know what? You gave it some. You gave it some in return. So respect to you. <laughs> and you're like, well, or you could have just listened to the show that I was going to do with the, was successfully without you yeah. on every other night of the week. The people didn't pay to see that person. That's the biggest thing but, I have a problem with. Yeah. But here's the thing. I think uh, my, my friend Carey made the point a while ago. He's like, the word heckle is so insufficient and unnuanced to describe all of the different ways an audience member can interact with you because it gets used to like that single word gets used to mean everything from someone responding to a question or slash responding to a rhetorical question which is slightly more unwanted right. to genuinely saying something positive or saying like a one word or chipping in all the way through to someone just bellowing like fuck you, your shit, or like, like every, and every shade of grey in between and every different type of thing gets described by this one word, and they're all so different. And and they're mostly pretty easy to deal with. Like, I think what... I know when I first started comedy, when I was about... When I was doing my first few open mics and that kind yeah. of thing, I remember having a mad panic, like, sort of, like a day where I wrote down everything I thought an audience member might say to me and every response that I might come up with in return. Like, oh, wow. Like, I... And then nearly never needed that. No, mm. and now, nowadays, I, I don't have any stock lines in my head. Like, if someone heckles, I try to I try to respond in the moment and genuinely and in kind. Yeah. Which, which can mean, like, if it's really negative, then maybe negative. But most of the time, I think people sometimes, particularly when they're new as well, particularly in America where heckling is much more frowned upon and they're really, like... It, they're not expecting it or they're not and particularly someone who's maybe started in LA and then goes out on the road for the first time they'll get one person heckle or just chip in with something really minor that you'd see as someone who's been doing it for longer and go oh you could just roll with that you could either completely ignore it which is sometimes a powerful tool just to kind of either either completely ignore it or acknowledge that you heard it and then make a point of ignoring it which can be quite powerful too just to kind of 
<laughs> look at the person who said it and just pause for a second and then carry on. Like, can be very funny to do. Uh, or or just roll, just completely roll with it and just right. Uh, just roll into the thing, and you see someone not realize they could do that, and they get the most m- mild of contributions from an audience member and just slam that person and the audience was like whoa that that seemed <laughs> that was an overreaction that was like <laughs> like i've seen it happen more than once where many times where particularly with someone who's you know, I've, not always and i've made the mistake before i've misjudged a crowd it's there's crowd psychology going on there as well but you <laughs> i like the word you use i misjudged a crowd and i just imagine you going like I guess some guy goes, oh, come on. And you're like, your mother's a whore. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. Matt. I've totally seen people do that. Like, I've seen people kind of go like, wait, go like, wow, that was, that's like if you were just in a bar and someone just bumped into you <laughs> by accident and you instantly like fucking nailed them. <laughs> you're like, he just, he just tripped. He tripped and you just, well, you're slamming his head into the concrete. Like, that's not the right, you're right, the right response. Yeah. And I think you, you have to do that on stage as well and even more so because people the people don't know their intent like i've i've also seen it kind of a, a comic be justified in their response but the audience not go with it because maybe like the worst kind of, here's a really bad type of heckler here's one that i is genuinely a, a unpleasant and wrong there are every so often someone will be right at the front and just be constantly but at a really low volume saying unpleasant shitty things to the comic oh my gosh and it's a rarity like this happens very rarely right. but sometimes you get i don't know what kind of sociopath that or just or really unpleasant <laughs> or just very drunk and sort of mean person mm-hmm. but the most of the audience can't hear what's happening and so the comic eventually just goes in really hard on that person and the audience is like whoa that seemed unnecessary and you're like no you don't know what they were oh but i can't now explain that to you without seeming really petty right uh, Everyone should have a mic in the audience. Right. <laughs> <laughs> There's, I, I've seen a lot of on YouTube videos, and it might be just because of the the ones that are posted. But man, some of those hecklers, it seems to me like they have that. Uh, I want the attention too. Like the, yeah. the comedian is getting well, on you stage. S- totally. And you sometimes, again, there there are all sorts of different reasons why people heckle, and some off. I mean, mostly alcohol is a large factor, but you sort of. Sometimes it is that thing of someone not like you. You see it a lot at office parties, like around Christmas. You'll sometimes see like one guy who doesn't like, who thinks of himself as sort of office alpha, and doesn't like that someone on stage is getting the attention, and then they'll yeah. start like trying to pipe up. You yeah. see that sometimes. Um, the work, <laughs> you know, the hardest ones to deal with are a very drunk woman who keeps talking. Because... Tell me about it. Uh, <laughs> I we looked at Nicole. We looked at Nicole. <laughs> She's a mess. She's drunk right now. But the, re- the reason <laughs> the reason why that's much harder than a very drunk guy who won't start talking is when it's a woman who's there. If you if you respond too harshly initially, like hitting you, her, you seem <laughs> okay. like slamming into Whoa. the concrete. Like we said before, Whoa. that's what you do. <laughs> but no, if you if you re- if you go in too forcefully initially you seem like a bullet you seem really mean Mm-mm. so you have to even more just kind of make sure the audience and most and also the longer i've been doing it the more like i hate those videos that people put a lot of the videos that people post online it's like comedian slams heckler and sometimes it is like that person really deserves to be put in their place but so often it's like no you yeah there's some funny stuff in there but you kind of enable that conflict because you know you because you knew you'd win it because most of the time you have a huge upper hand the audience is already on your side anyway because right. you've hopefully been making them laugh for the previous 10 15 minutes they um they also don't for the most part want the heckler to win because you're they're not the person that they paid to see yeah of course so you're at a huge advantage and sometimes you kind of go like no you could have diffused that situation like so like nowadays I would much rather keep an audience member on site. Like, if someone heckles a bit at first, if they, if I don't think they have malicious intent, I would much rather, if they're just drunk and they don't, they don't realize that they're being annoying, I would much rather try and turn them back into being a good audience member. Right. Than, than have them be the loser of an unnecessary conflict. Absolutely. Yeah. It's well said. There, there's a lot of actors, you know, that, who 
have branched out into comedy and vice yeah. versa, like comedians doing movies and TV shows. Do you have any tips or, or suggestions for any actor other than just go on there and, and do it? Well, who wants to kind of explore that type of... Uh, it depends why... Yeah, it depends why you're doing it. Like, LA definitely has... There's a certain contingent of people who've been told, you should do stand-up, because that's a good way to be seen. And right. Like, All right. Well, I I have no <laughs> tip for that person. Just, you do you. Do you. <laughs> but anyone who is really doing... You know what? There are courses, and there are books, and there are plus... But the truth is, there's nothing... None of those will get you past, like... They'll get you up to your third or fourth gig. They'll help you get on stage the first time. And after that, you just... There's no way to get good at stand-up other than doing it in front of an audience. Like, right. there really isn't. It's... It's weirdly, I think, unlike any other art form. Like, you can become a really good actor or musician just in class or in practicing in your bedroom. And right. you can't, I mean, like, you can't be a rock star without being in front of an audience. You can't learn that kind of stage interaction. But you can become a great guitarist just in your bedroom. You can't become a great stand up without constantly trying it in front of audiences, which is strange because it means you learn in public. You, you, Particularly when you start, like yeah. all of the mistakes you make, like as a musician, when you're just flubbing scales and you're hitting bum notes all the time. But it, you have to do that at a performance that people have paid for, like sometimes. Yeah, and you gotta you gotta callous up pretty quickly. It's a weird thing. It's a very weird thing. But it kind of there's no better way to learn because you. But on the other hand, you get instant feedback. You, unlike acting or unlike being a musician or whatever, you know instantly. You know if you've done it right or wrong. Like, you yeah. know if... I guess it, it's almost like a sport in that sense. Like, you know if you've... You know if your high jump technique is right because you either do or don't get over the bar successfully. And you know if you're doing... If you're on the right track for stand-up because either an audience laughs a lot or they don't. Like, you right. <laughs> well, you said something in the very beginning of that. You said, why are you doing it? Is it just to be like... You know, I think the reason why you do things is so important. Are you yeah. doing because you really love it? Or, you know, you feel like, man, I really want to try this or I think this would help further my career in no, some I, way you know what I, I mean I love like, stand up like yeah. I do I'll I do other things we all branch out into other things you know being like acting stuff and writing stuff and being on things as yourself like hosting or just or being a panelist on stuff and I like all of those things and I've enjoyed them in, to different degrees but stand up is the thing that it's the thing that I loved watching as a kid and it's the thing once I got to do it and I realized I had some aptitude in it it was the thing that I was like I this is this is what I'm doing. That's awesome. It but is. but that's cool. That's cool though. You also found other things to do instead of like, because like some people are like, I just love this one thing and that's all I'll do. I won't do anything else yeah. except this. It's like, well, there's more to the world than just that thing. You know, what you I kind of have to. And it also they all kind of help feed into each other. Yeah, the cross disciplines. Absolutely. Like they, to I mean, they totally do. And that might be another reason why actors try stand up because you learn certain, particularly if you want to do comedy acting. There's no, again, like, there's no better training for what is and isn't funny than doing it directly at an audience that will either respond nicely or badly. And then mm -hmm. you kind of go, okay, that's how you can then get to know whether you're good or not at right. this whole thing. And at, when I've, like, the bits of acting I've done have helped with stand up. Like, you sort of notice things about yourself. You sort of learn how to be stiller. That's a good thing. That's an important thing. Like, I know. Whenever I watch videos of myself doing stand up, I get annoyed at little physical ticks. Mm. Like I sometimes go, like, "What's my? Why is my left hand flapping around? Like, why am I? <laughs> what am I doing?" <laughs> I've done. Uh, I I did two uh, sets on Craig Ferguson's show, like when he did it, and the first one, my sister, you don't have a microphone for that. You just have a, like a lapel mic. Yes. And my it was my little sister who afterwards went like, "Why didn't you move your arms at all?" Because I realized. <laughs> I was just <laughs> like the first one of them. I just had my arms just down by my side the whole time because I like I didn't know what to do with my arms, so I just <laughs> kept them there. And then the second time, I think I overcompensated a bit too much, and my arms are doing too much stuff. Like, <laughs> you, you, you know, <laughs> like there there are things you can do. Like, like I I I quite like um Kamal W Kamal Bell on his show, which is not on anymore, but which is a shame because it was great. I, but he. He had a sort of. Uh, he would press his fingers together, almost like in a like in a prayer position, but slightly open. If that, mm. so I'm just like, I don't know. Why I'm describing to you, but for the listeners who aren't watching the video, right, right, yeah, right, right. No, I get it. like fingertip to fingertip, but slightly open palms. 
and he'd kind of go like, oh, that's that's a good thing to do with your hat. And then you could occasionally gesticulate, but he'd move, that he'd come back to this all the time. And you're like, oh, that's a good position. That's a good... Because you, you do... it's weird when you start thinking about it, and you, you're an experienced actor, do you ever get in your head about what your arms and legs are doing? Because you, you can start going like, how do I walk again? Which arm goes with which leg when I walk? And then you start <laughs> thinking about it, and then you can't walk properly. Then you, you know, start yeah, walking that's, that's actually a big thing for actors to really be aware of of their body yeah. and be self-aware of what you're doing with your hands and feet and like that kind of stuff. And it's also a comfortability kind of thing. Cause right now we're just sitting, yeah. we're talking, we're not thinking about what, like your hand is right here, yeah. like on your, on Matt's hand is on his face and he's kind of has his elbow propped up and he's not thinking about doing that. And like no, Jordan has his hand. Am, yeah. Now, now you are right. But like, if you, if someone were to tell you, Hey, do that, you would be like, why? Yeah, I'm doing it weird now. And I'm... Yeah. And then with film, that's becomes trickier if you're doing something that's single cam because you can't just be natural with your movements because you have to recreate them for the different camera angles. So you have that's... to remember that if you yeah. took a sip of water at this point, you have to do it again. Or if you move this thing to there, this is where your arm was. And then you become very conscious of it. And then for me, as someone who isn't an experienced actor, that suddenly becomes like... I trying hard not to be forced and not be weird while I'm right. doing these deliberate movements while saying someone else's words, but trying to make it as natural and comfortable as possible. Man, I'm so, I'm so excited that you said this because again, it goes back to cross disciplines, you know, right. like being a comedian and it's the first time you don't have a mic in your hand or you're holding onto the mic stand and that goes away and you're like, what? Yeah. What, what is this? <laughs> what I... Only a sibling, by the way, would say that. Like, I know. Why, why didn't you move your hands, man? Yeah. <laughs> like, that's something my brothers would say to me. Like, it's exactly that. It was good. It was a great note from my sister, but you're absolutely right. That is the kind of thing that you need us. You need someone who either isn't afraid of or slightly enjoys hurting your feelings. Right. Exactly. Way. Fearless exactly. feedback. Fearless, Fearless feedback. feedback. There you like, go. You're doing a weird thing with your face. Okay. My, my, uh, for the first time I did a, like a red carpet, like photo uh, thing. Oh man. So uncomfortable. I was like, I was the hands that it's the hands. Yeah. I don't know what it is. I was like side. And I looked like, I don't know. I looked like a prisoner. Like my first few photos. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> um, and from the side now, yeah, right? <laughs> like, photos like front and then side. <laughs> you took your license plate off your car before you, <laughs> uh, we're running out of time. Uh, before we go, it was such a pleasure having you on. Oh, I wish yeah. we could talk more and you're more than welcome to come back on whenever to. you want, man. Um, for any artist or actor or comedian, if if they're in like a struggling p- place, uh, what, what would you say? What would you say to them? One piece of advice you can give to the struggling artist. Oh God, I don't know because everyone's a struggling artist. I yeah. think that I don't know if that don't jump. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, it kind of is like you know what you you said earlier. Like, oh yeah, it kind of makes me feel better knowing that everyone like depression's so prevalent. Like you still realize, like every everyone in showbiz is is struggling. Like if. Like yeah. You probably look at every. I bet even there are days where Clooney wakes up and just goes, God, why is this guy out earning me now? Why is my star fading? <laughs> <laughs> like every, like everyone, there's always a level above you and there's always a right. level below you. And you got to sometimes get that out of your head. And yeah. I'm giving that advice to me right now rather than your listeners because <laughs> we all do it. Hey, uh, we all, we all need help and motivation, realistic motivation. So that's, that's the biggest thing. Cause in LA, there's a lot of, uh, Everything will be fine. <laughs> you could, you could, but there has to be some substance to to it as well. Nah. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for coming on oh, the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a joy. Yeah, of course. Uh, they can check out your podcast, probably Science on iTunes. Uh, website. All, yeah, iTunes, Stitcher, all, uh, probably Science dot com. All the places podcasts are. You can find that. And then I, I'm on everything social media as Matt Kirshen. Matt like, Kirshen. It's a weird enough name that no one managed to get it before <laughs> me. So M A T T K I R S H E M. But if you forget that, just Type anything vaguely near that into Google and it should pop up with me because it's weird. (laughs) And if you uh, haven't had a chance to listen to his debut CD, uh, I guess we'll never know. You should definitely check it out. Thank you. New one coming out soon. Oh, really? Yeah, I recorded it, but it's still being edited. So hopefully by the end of the year, there'll be a new one. Well, let us know. We'll uh, definitely do a a plug for you. Thank you so much. Of course. Uh, When we come back, the very talented, I'm so excited, Jenny O'Hara is coming on the show. We'll be back. Put a flavored condom on your head because your mind is about to get blown. High school is over. Blackout party at the beach, bitches. You're legit popular. Oh, Maddie f***ing McKibben. 
you have to tell her. I still want to be with you. You still want to be with me? Welcome to the Enchanted Fantasy Prom. Be sure to sign up for the raffle. You could win a rainbow. Awkward. Season 5, premiering August 31st at 9, 8 central. Only on MTV. We are back in the studio, and I'm so pleased to have Jenny O'Hara with us in the studio. <laughs> she has, uh, she's currently working on the mini project, King of Queens, <laughs> Devil, Big Love, uh, Mystic River, uh, over 140 credits on IMDb. That's amazing. It is great. Thank you for coming on the show. It's <laughs> You're welcome. It's such an honor and a pleasure having you on. And oh, thank you. I kind of geeked out before we started recording because I confirmed with Jenny that she studied with Lee Strasberg and Sanford Meisner. I did. Wow. Oh my I know. gosh. It was pretty amazing. Please, please, please. I'm sure our actor listeners want to hear some of the experiences. How did you even this was uh, this was a while ago in New York, right? Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. So who did you study with first? Or Lee. Was Lee. Yeah. And what was I know this is a very broad question. No, no, but it what was, was that it like? It was an amazing experience. I uh I got uh, I had a scholarship to Carnegie. And right. I got kicked out after a year because I was too young and having too much fun. So mm. they said, grow up and then come back. And <laughs> so I went to New York. And uh, I, and I just, you know, I couldn't figure out what they were talking about at Carnegie. Beats and all this stuff. It sounded like math to me. You know, they've since discovered that Stanislavski never talked about beats. It was a mistranslation. He said what? bits. Oh, Let's my gosh. Let's do that bit again. <laughs> 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 Isn't that brilliant? Wow. I know. I know. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. I want to read more on this. Yeah. Then. It's really, it's very interesting. Read The Fervent Years. There's a lot of stuff in What's there. What's it called? The Fervent Years. The it's Fervent about Years. the start of the group theater when Lee came up and yes. Sandy and everybody. Uh, wow. But uh, Strasbourg, I had a boyfriend at the time who was studying there. And I was able to arrange uh, an interview. And I was on the list for when there was an opening. But... I wanted to go right away. I just felt it was really important. I wanted to go right away. So uh, my boyfriend said, you know, he he understands that this is a very tough business. And so uh, he admires determination. So I said, okay. And I went to Carnegie Hall and I would wait outside class for him to come out. And I would start talking. I'd say, hello, my name is Jenny O'Hara and I'm an actress and I really want to study with you. And I came in to see you. I was interviewed and you said that I could be on the list, but I really need to start right away. And he would just walk right by me. And so I'm following down the hall and I never stop talking, never stop talking, never stop talking. <laughs> he gets in the elevator, he goes away. It's so humiliating. It's so horrible. <laughs> but I bet if I really want this, I have to really go for this. Oh, so, okay. So I did this for four, five, six, seven weeks in a row. Wow. And then I thought, oh, God. Oh, God. And then I found out where he lived. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my gosh, Jenny. This is amazing. (laughs) He had an apartment at Central Park West. So it was the fall, and it was a little chilly. So I got myself up there, and I said to the doorman, I'm waiting for Lee to come home, but it's kind of cold. Could I wait inside? And he said, oh, sure. So I tucked myself in a little cove in the hallway. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. And Lee came walking through, and I jumped out at him, and I said, Hi, Lee, I don't know if you remember me. My name is Jenny O'Hara. I'm the girl who always cries, but I'm not going to cry now. I'm really trying very hard not to cry because I need to study with you right away. I have an agent, and I'm being sent out of things, and I, I'm afraid I'll ruin my career before it even starts. And I'm talking, and I'm talking, and I'm talking. We're going down the hall. We hang a right. I'm still talking. I'm talking. I'm talking. We stop in front of the elevators. I'm talking. I'm talking. I'm nothing from him. I'm talking. I'm talking. I'm talking. The elevator door opens. It's full of maids at you uniforms who are coming up from the laundry room he gets in the doors start to close and he says call my secretary Boom. <laughs> <laughs> and i was in the next week <laughs> wow that is amazing it was i mean <laughs> i have actor chills right now you have to be tenacious <laughs> that i was just say that is like tenacity yeah. at its best yeah and they arranged <laughs> they arranged for me to audition because i made my broadway debut with alec Guinness and dylan so i was like the big deal in the classes at that point Wow. And they arranged for me to audition for the studio, but just to come in and do a final. And I did it, and that kind of no result. And then they arranged another one, and I thought, you know, these auditors who are actors are really pissed off. Mm. And I don't blame them that I'm not going through the process, and I can pay for class. It's no big whoop. I'll pay for class. 
it's okay. And they arranged for me to observe so I could observe and have all the privileges of the studio. But wow, wow. And learn wow. what I needed to learn. So, oh my gosh. Outstanding. And then I was doing a soap. And I did a soap for a year. Mm -hmm. and, and I was really... We had a really good director, and we were a young cast, so he kicked ass, and nobody was allowed to do cheap work. You couldn't phone it in. But I thought, oh, my God. That's good. I, I like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and, and, I, and it, it, you know, a new script every afternoon. You do the show live. You do the show. Then you'd have an hour break. Then you'd have the script for the next day. You'd rehearse that, block it, go home, learn it, and come back at 6 in the morning. <sighs> so I made a job. I love that, though. It was fabulous. I love, like, <laughs> as an actor, it's <laughs> like... Yeah, let's do it. Oh, man, you did nothing else. You just did that. But a lot of us were really concerned and thought, oh, God, you know, I've worked so hard to, to develop a craft. And have I blown it doing the soap? So I thought, you know, I've heard about Sandy Meisner. And he kind of starts with A. And I thought I should run like an engine check on myself. So I should go back Ooh. to the really basic things, you know, the word game. Hello, hello, how are you? How are you? That stuff. And so I went to see him, and I told him my concerns. And he said, okay, fine, start. So I started, but I was still going to Lee's class, and neither of them knew that I was going to the others. <laughs> they, they, they're because they were rivals. Right, yes. Absolutely, yeah. yes, yes. <laughs> and then uh, after a year of studying with Sandy, you're supposed to commit to two years. Otherwise, if you don't, you're kicked out. But I got offered a wonderful job in Summerstock. So I went to him and I said, I was offered this wonderful job. It means I'd be away from the summer, but I don't want to lose my ability to come. He said, go, do it. Just do it. Come back when you come back. So I went and never came back. <laughs> <laughs> that is wow. extraordinary. Yeah. It's amazing to me the amount of, I, I love, especially when I first started off in college, mm -hmm. I had an amazing, and I was really lucky to have this experience. We do a lot of different types of techniques and mm -hmm. we do it for like you know a couple months or mm -hmm. a few months or some of the techniques or styles we do for like a few weeks mm -hmm. and we just like drill them drill them drill them and i loved like okay and it's one of those things where when you're constantly learning quickly and i don't know if you experience this or jordan in your end but you have to start picking up things oh, yeah. fast yeah. and yeah. then it becomes snowballing. Like you start absorbing things so quickly and you're like, okay, cool. I can use this. I'll put this in my repertoire mm -hmm. if I need it. Mm -hmm. There are things I agree with, things mm -hmm. I don't uh, necessarily agree with, but that's okay. I'm just going to soak it in, right. keep it on the shelf for later. Right. right. And I love that. I love learning like, oh, there's a new technique or a new school. Okay, let me check it out. And just observing has become such an am amazing tool for actors. And for me, I'm really appreciating just kind of soaking it in, mm -hmm. S sponge it up. What can you get from it just from observing? And oh, it's just amazing to me. Oh, I love this stuff. Yeah. Oh, my God. Learning never stops. It never stops. It never stops. I started teaching, and it was really interesting to me. I've directed and stuff, but I was getting really bored with myself, and I was thinking, oh, God, I'm so bored with myself. Uh, maybe I should go back to class, just stir it up a little bit. And I was on the verge of doing that when I got a call from Risa Brayman asking if I would come in and teach. Uh, take over James Eckhouse's class while he was going to New York to do a Broadway show. And I said, okay. And that just stirred it all up again. So I didn't wow. need to go back to class. <laughs> the teaching did it. But, you know, just being plugged in, plugged into the work, observant, aware. Mm. You can learn as much. You know, one of the questions that you sent me was asking, you know, what do you do when you're not auditioning? Yeah. Uh, a couple of things you do. The primary thing is that acknowledge that the time that you figure has to be filled or wasted between auditions or jobs is, in fact, your life. Mm -hmm. So live it richly. I love that. Yeah. Oh, and there's so more beautiful. time in that downtime than there is in any other. Don't throw it away. Don't go to sleep. Don't ignore it. Every bit enriches you. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is to study because it's a gymnasium, and especially out here. If you're not a member of the theater company. Right. You, you don't go out that much. You don't audition that much. You don't work that much. And you have to stay in shape. So Absolutely. those are two vital things. Live your life and, <laughs> and keep in touch with yourself. Well, that's the show, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, I, I come across this, and I, a lot of our actors have as well. And, and this is a specific problem with auditioning. Mm -hmm. And I'm always curious, uh, sometimes with our other actors, what they do. Listening is a big part 
I feel with any act, with any performance or mm-hmm. acting in general and really feeding off what your partner is giving you. Mm-hmm. You're not on audition, reader is not giving you what you need. What do you what do you what do you do? Take like, advantage of it. How, like how? If you don't mind me asking. Try to get it from them. Mm. I mean, in any scene that you're doing, you you got to have a want. Or more importantly, I mean, I don't think want anymore. I think need. What do you need? Mm. What does your character need from that character? If you're not getting it, try to get it harder. Yeah. It keeps you absolutely alive, keeps you plugged in, keeps you focused. It's sometimes a gift. As long as you allow whatever's going on in you right. to punch through as well. Okay. Or um, substitute them. <laughs> or yeah, substitution. <laughs> like yeah. Or just substitute. No, yeah, yeah, or just, you know, <laughs> slot in somebody else. <laughs> Bring in another slide. That's great. Behave as if they're giving you what they want, which we do in life all the time. Mm. You know, <laughs> various <laughs> circumstances, we act like we're, yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> First dates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Oh, long gone. Thank you. There is uh, one of my favorite performances. And okay, so this is how I met Jenny, everybody who's listening. I was at the, I think we were at the NBC diversity party or Emmy diversity party thing. Yeah. Right. And you walk by me and I was like, I like, I like whipped around. I was like, I know that lady. <laughs> and I don't know why, but I'm a little scared and I don't know why. <laughs> I'm not Shirley MacLaine. <laughs> right, right, right. And I'm just like, I, I know her. I know. And I kept, I, I was like creepily looking at you and I was like, oh my gosh, I have to figure this out. And I walked up to you. And I was like, were you in Devil, the movie Devil? And you were like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I don't do this usually, but oh, it it's one of my favorite I love scary movies I love really good scary movies like yeah. suspenseful and really bad horror movies yeah. like really bad like B horror movies yeah, yeah. there's no in between for me it has to be here or there anyway I was watching Devil for a second time with my roommates and dur- if you haven't seen it yet I don't want to give too much away but there's a very intense moment with Jenny and oh my gosh my my roommate's dog was like right next to my armchair uh huh and we kept hearing the door like like open and stuff like uh-huh. that or like like noises at the door and so we kept like looking over me and my roommates and then we forgot that i know this is very complicated i'm r- rambling no, right. um, <laughs> you're setting the stage i'm setting the stage <laughs> one of our roommates had given a key to his girlfriend mm-hmm. and we we didn't know that right and so the door starts opening and it's in this very intense moment and we're trying to watch the movie and we're like wait a minute something's happening here <laughs> door opens and we're like whoa and then the dog like nuzzles my arm and I scream like bloody murder. And like, we, uh, and we, it's the very intense moment of the film. And we're just like, okay, everybody just calm down. <laughs> I just, just hate to see that. Pause the film. <laughs> What's going on here? Anyway, absolutely incredible performance in Devil. And I we talked you. a little bit about it. Yeah. And there was a moment you told me that they were contemplating prosthetics. Aesthetics, right? Oh, yeah. They made all of these, you know, faces, <laughs> things, body molds and uh, and all kinds of stuff and facial molds. And and <laughs> it was insane. So they did this whole thing on my face and we did a, a screen test of it. But uh, the, the honey wagons were parked away from the studio and nobody could see it, not even the other cast members. So they put a scarf over my head. And I have my hands on the shoulders of the AD, and we're walking along, walking <laughs> along, getting into a van, driving there. He says, okay, all right, now step down, I step down, and I can't see a thing because there are no eye holes in the right. fucking thing. So I'm walking along, I'm walking along, so the cable here, step over the cable, okay, I do that. And then, so we're in front of the camera, and then we do the camera test, and then we go back the same way. <laughs> Bronchitis, sorry. No worries, no worries. <laughs> and uh, it was, I, I said, so how, to the guys, you know, so how did, how was it? And Knight Shyamalan had said, you know, that they can never equal the audience's imagination, what mm. they think it might be. Yes. So I said, well, you know, I started spreading this around among the circle of producers and directors and ADs and writer. So, yeah, you know, maybe I could act. Why don't we 
let's see if we can make that work. Maybe just to, you know, I mean, black out my eyes or something. Those big black, solid right. black lenses mm. that are creepy with a little hole in the center. Oh, we can't have a hole. Yes, you can have a hole. No, no, we can't. Yes, you can. You can have a hole. Irises are black. The lenses are black. Right. I could have a hole. <laughs> okay, so I can see. So we did that. And they were over the moon. Wow. It's very chilling, too. It is. When, when, when it's like that, when you used to let the audience use their imagination. Yeah. Uh, I was in film school a long time ago. And uh, was it in film school? I don't know, remember what happened. Anyway, the scene is basically a woman on, she's talking on the phone, a kitchen phone. And she, her face is blocked off by a wall. Mm -hmm. And it's this like long shot. Entirely blocked off or partially? Uh, partially. Like you see part of her face maybe. And then mm -hmm. just like you, you see her hand in the phone. And as this scene is going on, you realize you, you've started to go like this. You're starting leaning to the right because you want to see what's around. What's see, around yeah. that corner. And then you catch yourself and you're like, what am I doing? It's a shot. <laughs> I can't see it. <laughs> but no, the, the audience imagination is an extremely powerful tool. That's amazing. They let you do that. Yeah, it is. Is that like it a... Is. And w when we shot it, Knight came running back from Video Village, you know, where they were, the monitors saying, we got it, we got it. We got it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and I, I was trying to come up with an image to for her for yeah. that moment. And I thought, Jesus, uh, you know, you know, when Jaws comes up out of the water... Yeah. Yep. That vertical rise. So I'm all crouched down behind the body. And then just. Ah. Straight up. Wow. <laughs> I love that. It was so much fun. No. Jordan, you were going to say something? I don't remember what You it don't was. remember? I don't uh, uh, Damn it. So, so sorry. Damn it. How do you, as an actor, discussing things like this with directors, maybe you have conflicting views on something. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you approach that? Well, the, it's the director's medium. Mm. So you start there and then you try and romance it, you know, yeah. and explain why you think it might be a little different. But what about, I mean, could, could this be what's, what's uh, driving her mm. so that there's some nuance in it? So it isn't just one color. Right. Could we maybe, and let me, let me show you and to try and mix it up a little and see if that is of any value to you. You acknowledge that they're in charge. And if somebody gives you a direction that makes no sense to you, and you try and do it, and they say, no, that's not it. The, the most effective thing is, oh, damn it, could you say it another way? Mm. And they'll say it another way. And it's still not making sense. Oh, sh I'm sorry. Could you say it another way? And finally, you find a language that both of you understand. Right. And then you can do it. And it's interesting. And it isn't disenfranchising anybody. Right, right. I think that, that was going to ask you was uh, with that decision to – to um i guess plant the seed to have yourself act it mm -hmm. was that something that you found to be either that the like the costume was a hindrance for your performance or that you felt like was it uh, a choice that you were making that you were nervous about actually executing to such a high degree like no no it, that didn't bother me at all <clears throat> what what stayed in my mind was uh was what knight said and also there seemed to be kind of I mean, this was a really well-made prosthetic. It was my whole head, mm -hmm. um, but I think there was a there was a sense of disappointment or not. Oh wow, this is it. This is the one. This is it. So I thought, well, you know, just give it a shot. But I I was like a cinnamon bun. I was sort of circling the target, <laughs> <laughs> so that when I brought it up, we would have a lot of people <laughs> kind yeah. of on board. <laughs> Very clever. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. courage, Jenny. Yeah, I get what you're doing. I get what you're doing. <laughs> keep that, keep that. I, I like the sneakiness. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've, you've, there's, as an actor, I think you might have mentioned this, but there's, you know, the highs, the lows mm -hmm. throughout your entire career, through oh, yeah. life. And do you feel it's important for actors to compartmentalize things before they go into an audition? Like, let's say something serious happens. Or you know they're they're really depressed or whatnot. Or do you feel like it's important to use that those feelings into the audition? Well, I think if you can use it, but there are a couple of ways to use things. Um, there's nothing that occurs in your life that is not useful for any particular character. Everything is of use. Mm -hmm. You can always tie it back. You can tie it into a backstory. You can tie it in the, the day before for this person. You can always do that if you hunt for it. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, sifting through. Yes. But uh, 
the other thing, there's, a, there's this wonderful actor and teacher called Alan Miller who was just, he's stunning. He's teaching at the studio now. But one exercise he used to do was to do the reverse. And he would give you a sound. You'd make a sound, you'd identify it, and a movement. And you would do a sense of memory of some kind, mm -hmm. so physical exercise. And when things were going great, when you thought the exercise was going really well or you were hot shit or whatever, <laughs> you'd, you'd, you'd make that sound and that gesture, and you wouldn't just flick it away. It would be, yo! <laughs> you know, it would be extended. Right. And if you thought it was crap, you'd <laughs> or whatever. Right. And then you'd reverse it. He would have you reverse it. So that when you felt it was crap, you'd do the <laughs> sound. And the degree of crap that you felt it was was the degree that you did that. Uh -huh. And then and the same with when you thought it was doing well, you did all the crappy thing. So the the object being uh, of the exercise being that whatever was going on, it was fuel for the truth. Mm. So it's always the truth. Gotcha, gotcha. Oh. You make a choice to flip it, but that flip is the truth. So you never, you never have to park yourself in the, in the uh, garage, right? To do a piece of work, there's always something. And he told this story about Streisand, and he used to coach her, and he coached her for Funny Girl and all kinds of stuff. But before that, she was singing in various clubs in New York, and somebody was coming for a record deal. And Alan uh, didn't see the first show, but he came in to see the second, and he went backstage, and she said, oh, I'm so tired. I just, I'm just useless. Just shot. And he said, how shot are you? And she said, that shot. And he said, okay. That's how you do the songs. And he said she was brilliant and got a record deal. Wow. wow. Nice. Just That's... doing the flip. That's a very, like, Tai Chi kind of, like... Isn't it great? Reverse the energy I kind know, of thing. I know. Yeah. I know. The energy, the energy is always there. You're going to use it in one direction or another. But the is is. That's like a positive concept for just living life in general. I so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, that's right. <laughs> that's right. The more pissed off you are, the nicer you Flip are. It. Yeah. The more available, the more open. Oh. I hate you fucking guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're running out of time. Oh, that's, ah. right. that's right. Um, before we go, you, you mm -hmm. said you, you're directing as well, right? Mm -hmm. you and is this current or this is... Uh, I'm not directing anything at the moment, at the but moment. I have, yeah. How, how is that translated from acting to director? Do oh, you find it, it's easier to communicate with the actors, obviously? Or? Yeah, I, it's really good. Yeah. It's really good. I, I tend to be uh, one of those, don't do that. <laughs> but also... <there's, laughs> I think he was actually doing something. Else, I know, for a second, I, thought, I was like, no, she's... Oh, no, no, no. I, I was like, okay, Jenny, I'm sorry. What, I'll stop. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I'm pretty clear. Yeah. And if there's a problem, then we talk about the problem. But, you know, to trying to find the trying to find the physical life of something, it's very important, the physical life yeah. that's going on in a play. And that'll lead you in many places. But I find that I, I direct like I act, which is that you just, you know, it's something that we do in class that, that is really difficult because in a play, you have backstory, you have texture, you have all kinds of stuff, and you have rehearsal. But when you're going into to uh, audition for a television show or something like that, often you have sides, and that's it. I mean, a lot of us who demand a script get a script, but sometimes they're just so damn precious about it you can't get it. Mm. But uh, so you have to learn how to do that for yourself. How to? It's like being a detective: follow the threads, follow the threads, and to put together a person. So that's how we rehearse a play: we follow the threads. And then execute it well. That's amazing. And if you don't, I'll say, could you do that better? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's a really an interesting thing to say. Because you're not giving a specific direction. You're not saying do this as if. You just say, could you do that better? Or could you get give me something else on that line? And the actor's imagination just comes up with fabulous stuff. It's, it's amazing how that works. It, it just It really works. Because you think, oh, yeah, I know. It really is like a mini miracle, in my opinion. It is. It's extraordinary. 
One of the hardest things I've ever done is I did a, a one woman show last uh, last Halloween called Broomstick mm. at the Fountain, and it was a big success. And it was forty nine pages of verse. Oh wow! And I've never done any Shakespeare. Oh. But I had seen Mark Rylance and his company in New York doing Much Ado and Richard III. And they spoke verse as if it was contemporary language. And I thought, fuck, I want to do that. I want to know how to do that. So that was the challenge. And I was also shooting two television shows at the same oh time, gosh. so it was a little awkward. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm also, I, I think I'm recurring on uh, Transparent. I've oh, done great. two shows. Excellent. That counts as a recurring and I, we'll be, yeah. I, and I hope I'll be back, but it's lovely. And so breaking the verse became the, the challenge. Mm. And learning the lines became the challenge <laughs> because I don't start learning lines till I'm in rehearsal, till I have a physical life for the person because it doesn't make any sense to me before then. Oh, that's really interesting to yeah. me. You tie it to whatever you're after, whatever you're going for with the other person, you tie it to that and then you tie it to the physical life and suddenly there's a map in your body, an emotional map and a physical map, and they feed each other and they feed the memory. In that play, I was talking to an imaginary person. I was talking to a, a young man who may or may not have been there. Mm. And I may or may not have been the Hansel and Gretel witch. Mm. I may or may not have eaten children. And she was a woman with a broken heart. And when 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 you when that part comes out, you just Yeah. She's the shattered creature living in the woods, talking to this young man whom she obviously loved when he was a child. But what happened to him? Did he run away? Did she eat him? Did she kill him? What did she do? So it was really interesting to work. And it works! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my gosh. Wow. But it was... Uh, oh, my goodness. Jenny. Delish. I, thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. Seriously. It's my pleasure. It's been amazing. Uh, <laughs> actor chills the whole time. It's a good thing to do, isn't it? It's been a very satisfying life. Oh, very. Very. Very lucky. Very blessed. Yes. Jenny, you're, you're on the Twitter, correct? It's Jenny O'Hara. I'm the Twitter. <laughs> the, you're the Twitter. <laughs> yeah. It, it's Jenny O'Hara Ullett. They're, they're, okay. Jenny O'Hara was taken, so I had to put in my married name as well. Ah, gotcha. U-L-L-E-T-T, -T, like gullet and mullet. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Such a pleasure having you Thank on. Thank you. Um, Thank you. It was been a treat. Absolutely. Jordan. Still here. You're still here. <laughs> yeah. I should get like a, what is it, 64th? 64 episode episode chip yep, you should <laughs> like, no, we've, we've done this I a while have now Jordan and I'm a producer <laughs> uh, uh, Jordan Burbank 7 on Twitter wonderful Nikki I, I couldn't get Jordan Burbank either. thanks for doing social media and uh, soundboarding today <laughs> Nikki 592 you can find her on the Twitter uh, thanks to GVB Studios and Gabe uh, thanks to Mindy Ferrano our, our new yes. segment producer on the show you can check her out she's got some great vines Instagrams they're hilarious you can find me at we Sam Keish and also our podcast, Actors Anonymous Podcast, our Twitter at Podcast AA. We love to hear from our listeners. Uh, always hit us up with questions, comments, suggestions. Uh, this podcast is for you. Uh, we love you guys. Thanks for all your support. Seriously. Find us on Patreon. Yes. Uh, it's a great website where you can actually subscribe for whatever you want to pay. Um, it's completely donation based and we have a lot of really great, awesome things that we can give to you guys for donating to us. Absolutely. Um, a lot of fun, interactive stuff. So. Be sure to do that as well. Absolutely. And always remember to listen, think, and then talk.